All right, what's up, everybody? We are back live, our second Facebook live uh, Zoom and our, I don't know, fourth or fifth, something like that, Zoom live chat overall. Done a couple on YouTube. Now we're on Facebook. Uh, welcome in, everybody. Again, you can um, you know use the chat. It'll be, I think, delayed a few seconds before we get it, but we will be watching that. You can use the chat to get in. Any of your questions we've got, actually – uh, plenty to talk about. I mean, Chris, when uh, when all this started, once we got past the shock of just uh, the real world implications of, of everything, <clears throat> excuse me, not trying to downplay that, but, and we started thinking about, you know, our jobs and uh, we were like, what, what are we going to have to talk about necessarily? And, you know, we sat down and we didn't really know, it, is it going to have to be all recruiting all the time or is there going to be other things to pop up. And I mean, between recruiting, between some more big picture stuff with college football and, you know, what they're going to do. Um, now you, I've actually seen some chatter continue to grow about the possibility of an expanded playoff um, between all those things. And now the fact that you have more uh, potential, um, it, it seems like coaching changes on staff. There, there's been plenty to talk about and that's no different today. So yeah, I mean, we're going to take your questions. We can sort of steer it wherever y'all want, but we actually, we've got a lot of stuff planned that probably can, can fill an hour here pretty easily. But um, Chris, man, um, how's everything still going over your way? I mean, I know I talk to you every day anyway, but um, it's, it's kind of been nonstop for us. Nothing as far as the, the workload, nothing has really changed. I, I, it doesn't seem like. No, I mean, there, there's no in-person things. I mean, there would be, you know, right now the spring would be over, you know, and so we would, aside from maybe having some, you know, of course, baseball would be going on. Um, you know, we don't know what would happen with, you know, basketball a while back, several weeks ago, but as far as football, which has sort of been people's focus right now, spring would have been over. So we'd be wrapping up, you know, Hey, what happened during spring? And we'd be talking about some spring storylines. We would be right in the midst um, two days ago, the spring evaluation period would have started. But it's been interesting because South Carolina did get five spring practices in. And so we've still been able to gain some information of, you know, what exactly happened then. And obviously there's plenty of storylines still that you can look to from the spring and then even projecting of when South Carolina does get back to practice. Um, you've got new coaches, you got a new offensive system, um, you've got a very important year for South Carolina. And then from a recruiting perspective, the, the staff is still basically sort of trying to run an eval period remotely, right? The, the difference is they're not able to go fly on a plane or, or drive in the car to go to a school and sit face to face with these coaches. But really, they're doing a lot of those same things. And that is they're trying to gather info on academics and athletics in terms of the progression of 2021 guys, but also 22 and 23 class. And they've been hitting the virtual you know, recruiting trail pretty hard. Um, and we've seen a lot of new offers go out. We've seen a lot of talk about that on social media. I know you've done you know, a couple pieces on that just in terms of South Carolina hitting sort of that virtual road. So there's still plenty going on, uh, still plenty to write about, whether it's coaching or recruiting. We've got an announcement to track tomorrow on Saturday. Um, so a ton of stuff going on. You're exactly right. Yeah, and, and the latest uh, that we're tracking being the uh, potential uh, loss of, of Brian McClendon, you know, I, I wouldn't – I mean, I would categorize it, I guess, like this. I wouldn't say that it's official as far as there being any type of announcement on, on Oregon's side, um, you know, and I'd imagine some of what's going on, big picture maybe slows down an official type announcement. But, but I, I think also safe to say um, when you look at all the – reporting around the country on this and you look at what we've heard as well um you know first started really tracking the rumors yesterday um it, it appears that that this thing is pretty solidly going to happen that he'll be leaving for uh, for Oregon uh, we'll be working with their receivers it, it seems like I saw Bruce Feldman mention the uh, passing game coordinator uh being likely as well but uh you know this is something we saw before where McClendon was uh, you know actually uh, being pursued a bit by the the Rams at one point and then uh, interview with the Steelers. And I, I think just whenever, you know, when he got demoted uh, from the play calling or, you know, duties, 
and he was obviously kept on staff. And this isn't a situation, I think, important to say, this isn't a situation where South Carolina tried to, to push him out. Obviously, he and Mike Bobo have a longstanding, really solid relationship. And Mike Bobo, very high on Brian McLennan as a coach. So not some situation where he's getting pushed out. But I, I do think w with all the talk last time, we've sort of always known that this was a possibility, Chris. Now, um, is it a little bit weird that it's happening, you know, mid-April? Uh, you know, maybe so, but there, there's really no normal right now. There, you know, everything's sort of weird yeah. right now. So I, I guess we maybe shouldn't be surprised. No, not at all. And, you know, this was sort of, I think there was um, a bit of, I guess you could say an expectation for a while that if the right opportunity came along, that Brian McClendon would move on, you know, to a different situation. And, it's been pointed out to me around the time of all that Steelers stuff that Brian McClendon wasn't just trying to jump for any job because, you know, yeah, he was in the running for the Steelers job that ultimately went to Ike Hilliard. Jericho Cotri was in the mix for that job. But, um, and we don't know the ins and outs of exactly what, how all those conversations went, but he, he, I don't think he was offered that job. But he did apparently have an opportunity to join at least one NFL staff in the offseason that he didn't go for. Um, and so that, to me, illustrated that, hey, even though, you know, he was demoted um, and there was a lot that went into that, you know, I mean, Will Muschamp's talked at length about it, about how there are a lot of different moving parts to the offense. I think he's defended Brian McClendon in that regard. They had to make some changes there. Um, and. I think you look at that, the fact that he hasn't just jumped immediately or jumped at the first opportunity shows he wasn't just looking to bolt. But that said, um, offers to go out. He's, he's had some opportunities to do some other things. And this is one that came along that was good. And so I think there's two different parts to it, Wes. You look at number one, a guy that, you know, after, say, the 2018 season, you know, not after the bowl game necessarily that year, but after that 2018 season when South Carolina had put together some good offensive performances overall, you look at that, um, he was a hotter rising name, you know, um, he had some, you would see some talk online sometimes about me being able to move on to a bigger situation or maybe go get a head coaching job, things like that. And then 2019 happened and it was so up and down for South Carolina. Then they got hit by injuries and then things just nothing went right on offense, especially towards the end of the year things dramatically change and that's sort of the nature of the business. Um, but I think you look at that, the fact that he got moved from OC to now a position coach. And you also look at the fact that Wes, let's just call it like it is right now. Oregon's a more stable situation. You know, um, they, they've had a good team last year. They've got a, a head coach who's relatively new there and they've done well so far. They've recruited pretty well. Um, and at South Carolina, you got – they're going into a year, a season where they've got to win some games. And on top of that, they've had the added – bonus isn't the right word, but you know where I'm going with it. They've had the added aspect of being very publicly placed on the hot seat by the administration. So, um, you know, McClendon leaving in some ways is not that much different than, say, a Coleman Hutzler leaving. Coleman Hutzler leaves. He gets an additional title as a co-defensive coordinator. He goes to Texas where – the coach, I don't know, Tom Herman, some people say he's a little heated on the hot seat this year, but um, possibly a more stable situation there with a title and a raise. And so for McClendon, someone who was demoted, things haven't gone as well lately, you know, you take this new opportunity. So I think it makes a lot of sense from that regard. Yeah, no doubt. Um, let, let's hit a few of the questions. Uh by the way, thanks, everybody, for joining in. Uh, hit us with your questions at the bottom. I'm going to try to uh, hit everybody's questions. We've already got maybe one or two in. Uh, where, where's everybody joining us from? I know we did that last time. Who's, uh, who's the furthest away? What's everybody doing today on this Friday? You're working from home. You're working at all. What, you know, what's going on? Um, talk to us. Let's see. Uh, I'm trying to get to it. Okay, Andy, tuning in from North Augusta. Uh, does this affect 2021 wide receiver recruiting? Uh, you know, that's a good question. Any, anytime a coach leaves, it, it's going to affect things, obviously. And, um, you know, I, I think uh, if you look at South Carolina's board, obviously they uh, – Jay's in from Utah again. Obviously they, um, they have a situation there where, you know, you, you already have a commitment at wide receiver. You have several other guys that they're tracking and recruiting at wide receiver. Chris, I – 
I don't know if I would say there, there's one guy who is like maybe a not committed, but is a huge lean to them right now at wide receiver uh, that this is going to have a, a big effect on, you know, I, I mean, obviously you look in state, you look at an offer from, you know, to JJ Jones, as we talked about um, about two weeks ago, you know, yeah, I, I think he's got a good relationship with Brian McClendon. I, I think this would affect him in the short term a little bit, but it, you know, when you talk to JJ Jones and you know, interview him or whatever is, is Brian McClendon the number one reason he's considering South Carolina? I, I don't think so. I, I think it was more about um, his home state school, the chance to possibly play in the SEC, the chance to possibly, um, you know, stay close to home and play with Luke Doty and all those things. Um, you know, you, you look at, at Sam Reynolds. Yeah, I, I think uh, BMAC had, had a, you know, a part in that. He was a factor. But um, I think th this staff recruits – as a team so much and so well to where you're not just talking about one guy being on a kid or, or even two guys for the most part, these, these kids get to know a huge portion of the staff. So to me, I mean, you may, you maybe can think of a guy or two, obviously it's going to have a big picture effect and um, whoever is coaching receivers will have to come in and maybe develop a, a relationship. If, you know, whether it's somebody coming in or somebody getting shifted, but you know, for the most part, I, I don't think there's a guy out there, Chris, where I'm just saying this completely just uh, tanks South Carolina's position with them. I wouldn't think so. And I think you made a good point about sort of the whole staff approach. Um, you know, th this staff, they have areas in recruiting. And so you see some of that in terms of the relationships, but they also do a lot of positional recruiting. You know, when you look at Mike Bobo is going to be really involved with all the quarterbacks, um, you know, whoever the running backs coach is, is really going to go after, you know, landing running backs in the class. Eric Wolford's going to handle the O-line. So there is a lot of positional involvement. So that does mean relationships with position coaches. But Will Muschamp's always, as a head coach, um, going to be extremely involved with all the big targets too. And so, you know, any of these guys that we talk about, with J.J. Jones from Myrtle Beach or, say, Malcolm Johnson out of Virginia, the fast, you know, uh, track slash football athlete that they're targeting, uh, Breon Pass from North Carolina. There's a bunch of them, maybe seven to ten guys at the receiver position that they're really looking heavily at. There's going to be familiarity with the rest of the staff. And when you structure it that way, when you lose a guy, it's not always, you know, spelling disaster for you. There, there are certain guys that you can look on the roster and look at who recruited that person or who the position coach was, and you can look at it and say, yeah, if this position coach didn't have that relationship at that time, they probably wouldn't have gotten the guy. For example, Marshawn Lloyd, Thomas Brown, you know, that's one that really stands out to me just off the top of my head. But um, I think with some of the continuity, um, it, it remains to be seen, but that could help. And Wes, I think you go to, you know, you look at the options. Now there's a receivers coach position open, but I think what we expect is for, you know, some further offensive shuffling to happen. And so, you know, if that's Joe Cox to receivers, for example, he's going to be familiar with a lot of these guys, probably communicated with some of them in some form or fashion already, whether it's a campus visit or somebody in his area, you know, somebody over social media. Yeah, and um, by the way, uh, anybody listening that's on here right now, uh, we appreciate it. Please hit the share button. We're trying to spread this thing around. Uh, so if you got Gamecock fans on your, your news feed, spread it for us a little bit and uh, help us out. Uh, but, yeah, I think you're right, man. If it ends up being Joe Cox, he – I think he already knows – he's going to know pretty much any offensive guy that they're already after anyway. So, um, that aspect sort of helps. And, you know, and we're, we're just speculating on, on what those changes might be. Uh, it does seem like a shuffle would, would need to be in place. Obviously, the name – and, uh, let's see, Chandler checking in. Um, the obvious question is uh, – who's going to be hired to fill McClendon's spot. Uh, you know, that remains to be seen. I don't think anything is official or, or done right there right now, but you know, Des Kitching's name has been mentioned a lot online. Obviously we know he interviewed for the opening last time. And uh, you know, you, you look at the last time they, they had to hire somebody. It, it actually ended up that uh, because they had had to bring in an extra offensive coach when um, what I guess when Coleman Hutzler left um or no even before that 
they had uh, they had moved Kyle Krantz off the field. And, um, th you know, th there's been a couple of different shuffles. So it, it kind of uh, all runs together. But point being, when Thomas Brown left, they didn't directly replace him with a running backs coach. They uh, they they put they brought in Rod Wilson um, is, is actually what happened. So they brought they added a defensive coach, even though they lost an offensive coach to sort of add things back uh, to make them back even. So at the time, though, Des Kitchings was someone that they interviewed, someone that they're involved with and somebody that was very, very interested. So, yes, that name has come up again. Um, you know, we'll be we'll see if that's what ends up happening. But I, I think, Chris, what we do know is that that would make a lot of sense. Um, he's from the state of South Carolina, a Furman grad. He was at NC State for eight years, has North Carolina recruiting ties, which is something I think we talk about all the time that South Carolina needs to continue to sort of uh, mine, I, I guess. They need to continue to mine those areas for, for prospects and um, recruit his position very, very well at a place, you know, we always talk about, are you recruiting to a logo school or not? Um, NC State, not really necessarily a logo school. So when you're able to sign high three-star and four-star guys at a school like NC State, which obviously isn't a terrible program, just isn't, it's not even the marquee program in your state. So for, for what he's able to do there and what he did there, I, I think if that ends up being the hire, then you certainly see why it makes sense. It, it just checks the boxes for what I think you're looking for in a potential running backs coach. And then obviously if he is as the running backs coach, that would, you know, entail some shuffling. We'll, we'll see what that ends up being. Um, you know, last time all this happened, there was a lot of speculation online that ultimately I think got passed around as a fact and it, it didn't end up being true. It was more speculation. So I uh, want to be clear. We're not saying this is definitely going to happen, but um, if it plays out that way, I think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it does. And, you know, Kitchings has coached, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Wes, I think really just uh, exclusively running backs, but he has had a little bit of tight ends experience, you know, during his career. But by trade, you know, he's a running backs coach and he's been effective at it. You know, you look at some of the guys that, you know, he had at uh, – he was at Bandy for a while and had, uh, you know, who were the guys there? War, uh, Zach Stacy and Warren Norman, I think couple of uh, productive backs there. And then you look at NC State with Matthew Days, Naheem Hines, Reggie Gillespie. You know, he had some good players there as well. And, and you're right. I think the point about, you know, the non-logo recruiter is something that's really intriguing, no matter what spot. You know, when you look at a coach, you look at his recruiting track record. Sometimes you have to run that through the filter a little bit. You know, if he's recruited at Alabama, um, for example, that's, that's good, <laughs> you know, but you, you run it through the filter of, okay, can he, can he take that to another spot? And so some coaches, um, I think show that they can go to places and recruit and put together, you know, some talented classes, you know, no, no matter which spot they're at, at their position, um, or, if, you know, Will Muschamp, he scored some, victories as a head coach at South Carolina that have frankly surprised some people, you know, whether you look at Zach Pickens or Jordan Birch, for example, or some of the guys he got early in his tenure and they need to get more of them, of course. Uh, but I think he's shown that he can go to South Carolina and win some of those recruiting battles as a head coach. And it's the same deal for position coaches. So when you look at Kitchings, he has that pedigree of being able to do that at a place like NC state that would probably translate to South Carolina as well. Yeah, I think so. Definitely, man. Like I said, uh, just checks every box, uh, fits what you're looking for. We'll, we'll see when that ends up happening, if that ends up happening. Uh, the timetable on all this stuff, uh, you know, remains to be seen. Uh, let's see, Taylor's got a question. Uh, do you expect the defensive line being more or less productive this year? Maybe more depth, but less experience. Yeah, I think that's a good question. We, you know, we've talked about that a bit um, on these shows. Chris, I mean, I, I would say, you know, you're going to miss Javon Kinlaw. That's, I mean, that's an obvious he should be, you know, at least, I mean, we'll see. He's a first rounder. We'll see where he gets picked next week. But, um, you know, top 20, top 15, where he lands, uh, we'll, we'll find out. But uh, anytime you lose a talent like that, you know, it's going to hurt. And he was the guy I think you look on that line this past year where you, you always want to have a, a guy that defensive – or excuse me, that offensive coaches have to account for. And – 
who's the guy that when your opponent is game planning, they say, I don't want to let this guy beat me. And, but in turn, that leads to them putting more resources um, towards stopping that guy. And it opens things up for everybody else. Uh, to me, the question on a defensive line is not a question of, of overall talent. It's just, is there going to be someone who steps up and takes over that mantle as the, the best player on that group? And is he an all SEC type talent? I, I think they'll miss DJ Wanham as well. The fact that he just, if you listen to the coaches, DJ Wanham was one of those guys that did everything right from being the first guy on the field, from the meeting room to being in the right spot on the field. Um, he won't be as big of a loss as far as someone we talk about being a big loss, but he will be a big loss as far as just the stuff you don't even notice or don't even see, I would think, from a play-to-play -play standpoint, being in the right spot, um, forcing uh, a play back inside, holding up the edge. Uh, all the little things is what DJ Wanham does. So I, I think it's a very talented group. I think over time, I think early in the year, Chris, th there may be a drop off. But I think then over time, maybe this line could potentially, uh, potential being the key word there, be better or at least as good as the one from this past year. And I, I think some of it, frankly, not to put it on a true freshman, that they need some edge guys. And I think, frankly, you know, Jordan Birch is going to have every opportunity, I believe, um, to, to step in and, and provide that edge rush presence because you really feel pretty good about all the other spots. Um, is Brad Johnson really ready to be a uh, dependable starter? Or, to, you know, does, does, does somebody like Jordan Birch come in and ultimately take that spot? Yeah, I, I think there's, there's a lot of intrigue behind that position. I, I can – be pretty I think we can all be pretty assured that they're not going to have a Javon Kinlaw on that line because he's he's not a player you see all the time he's not a player you see at any school you know uh, much less South Carolina on a consistent basis you know when you lose a top 10 pick who is a defensive tackle of his caliber you don't see that a ton um, and and look there are other guys on this defensive line I think that'll be draft picks and could end up even be fairly high ones in their career but he's a player you don't easily replace but the biggest question I think is just can some of these other guys take steps forward you feel good about some of the spots um you know you look at the edge and Aaron Sterling and JJ Anagbari had good seasons last year both of them played their best ball last year you get Kier Thomas back along the defensive line which is pretty significant because he can do he can play inside or out for you um, you know, Brad Johnson is a guy that I still think has talent and can take a step forward as long as he's healthy. If he can continue development, Rod Fitton, you know, can play Sam or Buck for you. Birch, like you mentioned, once he gets on campus. If you even got some guys like a Devontae Davis, Javari Ellis, you know, some guys that, uh, you know, Devontae didn't play at all last year with an injury. And Jabari has been, you know, working his way up and I think is poised to make a bigger impact this season. To me, the biggest question is how much of a leap, how much of a jump in progression uh, does the duo of Rick Sandage and Zach Pickens make? You know, if those two um, can play up to their talent, take another step forward, that's going to be significant for this group. And I think you feel better about it as a total unit, you know, going in if those guys can develop pretty quickly and get their feet under them early in the season. Yeah, and I mean, we're talking about, I think, when they first got here, they being the staff, Chris, we talked about the need to continue to upgrade and, and fix the defensive line. And I think when, you know, I think you made this point the other day, man, I don't remember, maybe it was on the podcast, when Keir Thomas was having to play at what, 260, 265 pounds as a true freshman. Against Georgia. Play, <laughs> yeah, play, playing defensive tackle. Yeah. Um, inside. So not even out on the edge. And, and then, so that, that's what you were set with as, you know, your, your first year in the program, first year running the program. And now, you you know, if Jordan Birch comes in and plays, it's going to be more because Jordan Birch is good enough to, to take a spot. If, um, you know, if, if one of these younger players ends up playing more than we expect, it's really because they beat out someone that's older than them, not because they were forced into action. Um, Jordan could be, I think, the maybe the long guy in this bunch that you would say, 
maybe does potentially have to get forced into action a little bit early just because of his natural ability and the need for an edge guy. But I, I think when you're talking about your defensive tackles and that sort of traditional defensive end spot, the strong side spot, you look at uh, Enigbare, like you said, coming back, Aaron Sterling, who I think is one of the more underrated players on the roster. Those guys coming back, the depth at defensive tackle, you really feel good at least about there being a, uh, a foundation of guys there. Now, uh, who's going to step up and be the man? Who's going to make the big jump? Can Pickens or Sanders do it? We'll find out. That To me, that will be the difference between a solid group and middle of the pack group and potentially a, a really good group will be if those guys can just take that next step and, and be what we all thought they were going to be when South Carolina recruited them. Yeah, I mean, th there is talent here. And, you know, I look at, you know, guys that we mentioned that haven't factored in quite as much. I mean, Jabari Ellis has been talked about by the staff, but they really like Jabari out of junior college. You know, the first year was more of a struggle to him because he wasn't able to get on campus early, supposed to be an early enrollee, wasn't able to do that. So the learning curve, you know, and transitioning to playing inside. Uh, Devontae Davis was a guy they liked, but he had the Liz Frank injury. So, you know, that sets you back, but there, there are some guys that can play on the roster. I think you just look at losing DJ Wanham, who I think he hit it. He's He was so consistent. He's like a coach on the field, um, probably undervalued as a pass rusher because he's not just an elite, elite athlete. Um, like, a say, a Jordan Birch, you know, is going to be a guy who athletically can give you even more than DJ Wanham. But really, DJ underrated there. Um, and then, you know, losing a guy like Ken Law, who was really just a freak, you know, <laughs> to, to put it uh, in plain terms. So those are difficult losses, but you still have some guys who played a lot of football, who have a lot of talent. And so as long as you can stay healthy, I think that's key at any spot. But if you can stay healthy and bring along picking Sandage, I think you feel pretty good about the edges. Really picking Sandage and Brad Johnson are the guys that you really need to take you know, one more step forward for you, and then you can have a pretty solid unit in there. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, we got a good little group of people in here right now, so appreciate y'all uh, joining us, and um, keep keep sending in your questions. Keep uh, commenting. Uh, let's see, Gray Mills, uh, let's see, says, really concerned about the wide receiver spot. Can you discuss who might step up? Yeah, I think that's a a common concern right now. Chris, we've talked about it all offseason, really, uh, to me, and, and it really, honestly, every time we do these little chats, that position group tends to pop up, and, and there, there's a reason for that. I think that's the position that has the most unknowns right now. Um, you know, can, can some guys step up is the question there. It's not that that group completely lacks talent. It's that that group has had guys that have had a combination of injuries, of not playing up to their potential, of more lingering type injuries, you know, in the type of, you know, in the concept of, of Ortre Smith, you're, you're talking about someone who just has, has had something that he's dealt with his entire life, um, a, a medical issue with his knee that they've fixed. And the question is, will he ever be back completely full speed, 100%? Uh, Randrikis Davis is someone that was a four star player who just never has quite been able to stay healthy for for various different little nagging injuries. Um, you look at Chad Terrell, he was a, a pretty highly regarded guy in the rivals rankings. Um, that might be another discussion, but um, has, you know, had the, the major knee injury, the major knee surgery. So um, it, it's not totally that South Carolina can't be good there. They could still potentially be good at, at wide receiver. To me, uh, it's just about guys stepping up. Shy Smith having a big senior year. Xavier Leggett having a great offseason. It hurts him that he was not able to go through a full spring practice, that everything got cut short because of the coronavirus. And, um, you know, can, can one of these freshmen come in? Uh, can Josh Van have, a, have a, a big leap from sophomore to junior year? It's not that there aren't guys. It's just they're, they're unknowns, which uh, I think is scary. And probably if you look at all the position groups on this team, uh, that's the one I think you probably have the, the most concern about going into next year. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, the, the maybe the frustrating part even um, for Gamecock fans when they look at this position group is 
you know, there have probably been some guys that maybe based on ranking, they haven't played up to it. And part of that is I think it is fair to look at that and question, okay, maybe was this guy, you know, should he have been ranked aside? And you can say that about certain guys or others. I do not think that's the case. And I, I look at the situation and say, you know, I, I've said this multiple times. Last time we did this Zoom deal, I think I said this. Um, I feel like there is more talent on the roster than has been shown. Do, do I think that means South Carolina has an elite room as far as the, as, as the receiver position? I do not think that um, compared to some of the other top teams in the country. Um, I, don't, I don't think they have an elite group. But they have a group that's better than what's been shown on the field. You know, and you look at last season and it was just all sorts of things. You know, I, I think they're missing Debo Samuel. Brian Edwards had a really good year again, obviously, but Josh Van had a slump in his sophomore season, um, struggled with drops. That was one of his biggest assets in high school coming out. A scouting report said he had really good hands and you can go check the film and, and verify that or talk to anybody that played against him or with him in high school. So can they erase that? You know, Xavier Larguette, it was his first year playing receiver. So athletically, he's he's a super impressive guy athletically, but can he translate that year to become more consistent, learn the nuances, be a consistent catcher of the football to carry on Joyner? Can he successfully make that transition to the slot? I think he showed in little spurts last year. He was injured part of the time. He's bouncing back and forth between quarterback and receiver because of the – offensive situation the injuries there at quarterback can he become a threat at slot and I think the answer is yeah I think he showed at times last year in the limited spurts that uh, he did some things naturally there and he's a really good athlete can Ortre be healthy and be back so Shy Smith you know he has to become the guy you know he needs to take it from uh, you know what he's done which is really good in, in spurts to becoming a consistent performer because South Carolina's had you know, a guy the last two years, whether it's Debo the year before, Brian Edwards last year, that they could say, this is the guy that we're going to, and Shy really needs to be that. So there are, you know, uh, and maybe even an incoming freshman or two as well, like Jakari Caldwell, they have to be able to stay healthy, be able to be balanced offensively, you know, not vacillate between being really good at running the ball and completely ineffective. They got to play well at quarterback. So it's all these different parts together. But I do think even with losing Brian Edwards, that the collective, that the guys behind the number one, you know, take a little bit of a step forward. That's certainly South Carolina's hope, and that's what they're going to have to have. Yeah, no doubt, man. So uh, let's see. Let's roll through a few more questions here. Uh, Roderick joining us. Uh, Chris wants to know, why doesn't Muschamp and Wolford go after more five-star offensive linemen? You know, I – I think that's probably two, a two-part answer. For one, I think we've seen uh, Eric Wolford sort of he, – he's going to go in early on, on guys. And, and generally, there just aren't many five-star offensive linemen in the country. There's a handful of guys that are spread all around the country. Um, I don't remember. I'm trying to think off the top of my head. When was, first of all, when was the last time there was a five-star offensive lineman in the state of South Carolina? Oh, I we'd, we'd have to dig deep on that one. I, I can't remember it. I mean, you've had some – so Brent, Brandon Shell was a very high four-star, I think. Yeah. Um, John Simpson that went to Clemson was a high four-star guy. Zach had, Bailey was up there, but uh, – Yeah, Zach Bailey, Donnell Stanley. There have been some highly recruited guys in state. Uh, but for the most part, there there aren't five star linemen in the state of South Carolina. Offensive linemen, I should say. Most of those guys end up being you know defensive linemen that you find in this state. Uh, then I think the fact that Wolford has a very particular skill set he's looking for. He most of the time gets in on his guys early and offers early and tries to get it out of the way, which a lot of times means some of these guys haven't gotten uh, you know the big offer list yet or gotten the big ranking yet. And, um, you know, the other side of that is he, he's going to go for what he thinks um, fits what he's looking for, and he doesn't really seem to care about what the ranking ends up being. Now, a lot of these guys end up being highly recruited. I, I mean, you look at, at Dylan Wanham. He's one of the highest-rated offensive linemen I, I think South Carolina has ever signed without 
looking at that entire list. Um, let's see, Chris, if you, if you go back to last year, uh, last class, I should say, South Carolina actually had a couple of guys committed early on who um, ended up being extremely highly recruited kids that, that ended up decommitting where South Carolina got in on them, uh, you know, super early before they blew up. Um, and I, I'm – losing the name of the Alabama kid that ended up switching from South Carolina to Auburn and then Auburn to Alabama. Um, you know, you, you've had guys that they've been in on early and some of them they've been able to hold on to, some of them they haven't. But I, I think it's just a combination of that being a position that you have to recruit um, as far as evaluation goes, and then you have to develop. It's not a position like a running back spot where you just can just sign a five-star and it's plug and play. It's a very different position as far as recruiting and evaluation and every offensive line coach sort of has different things that I think they uh, prioritize in the evaluation process. Yeah, it, it is a difficult, it's one of the more, you know, and this is another discussion too. It's one of the more difficult, um, you know, positions to evaluate and, you know, you can go look at whether it's in, you go look on a college roster or NFL and it's always sort, almost always sort of a mismatch of mismatch of just guy who played at a small school or guy who wasn't a big recruit or whatever it may be. Um, I remember Lane Johnson, you know, was I think the seventh overall pick in the draft one year, number one draft pick, number one uh, first round draft pick. And his, his rival's profile, he was a six foot six, 202 pound quarterback prospect. Um, and then he ended up going to Oklahoma. I think he was a tight end at first, and he ended up on the O-line, eventually got to a 300-pounder and was all everything. So it is tougher to, to, I think, answer the question about why do they not go after more five-star offensive linemen. The simple answer is by the time that these kids get a ranking, you know, the staff is evaluated. All, they continually evaluate, but they they don't – go offer kids based off, all right, guys, let's go check the rivals rankings or whatever service. And if a guy's a five-star, we're going to take an additional look or we're going to go jump in and offer them. That's not how they recruit. And you can't afford to recruit like that nowadays. Um, some schools do it. Um, and not to say South Carolina is first on every guy because they're not by any means, but Wolford does, like Wes said, get in really early on guys. Um, he's probably got 50, you know, 15, 20, 23 guys that they've offered or getting ready to offer very soon, for example. Um, 21 is almost done in terms of evaluations. Now they're just going to target some guys. So um, there have even, believe it or not, there have been some, there have been some uh, five-star guys that other schools have recruited that South Carolina didn't want, um, and they've gone to those places and they've not done much. Um, there have been some other five-star guys that South Carolina did want, and they've gone on and done very well. But I think, Wes, when you just look at the the track record, you know, for example, um, you know, 2010 is is really a class that I think sticks out. It was the really Wolford's first class, you know, or his only full class his first time at, at South Carolina. And it had, you know, Corey Robinson, who ended up being an NFL player, and Ronald Patrick, who been, ended up being an NFL player, and A.J. Can, who played in the NFL. Um, you know, Cody Gibson ended up eventually being a blocking tight end, but he was a solid player. There are really only a couple guys. One of them never made it to campus, and then Tramel Williams transferred. So the guys who stuck around ended up being starters, and three of them made it to the NFL. And so that's pretty good. Um, you look at some of the guys, you know, Ja'Kai Moore, for example. He was a mid-three star, but Penn State wanted him. Clemson wanted him. Um, you know, he started some as a true freshman last year. Jalen Nichols was a low three-star. He started uh, for South Carolina last year at, at tackle, which is tough to do. Um, so I, I think it's just the, the main answer to the question and not even going into whether or not it's right or wrong strategy is you just – they don't recruit off a list of saying this guy's a five-star, we're going to recruit him. Um, some guys, because O-line is so difficult to project, you got to – get in on some of them early and then, you know, their evaluations. I mean, some of them are going to be a lot different than, than another school. Yeah, no doubt. All right. Let's um, get a couple more of these questions. Um, I'm going to loop these two together. Dylan, hang tight. I'm going to come back to yours. Uh, Charles wants to know, will Lloyd be a premier back or will he be a complimentary back? And if so, 
uh, to who. And uh, let's see. Dean wants to know how far off is Kevin Harris. So, uh, you know, we'll lump those together. Uh, Kevin Harris was actually dealing with, I, I guess, I'd assume some type of injury at some point this spring. I, we know that he wasn't out there um, as much when we were able to watch, which was a little bit. But um, so Kevin, I, I think, was dealing with some injuries. Marshawn, uh, along with Luke Doty, th those are the two true freshmen that we just heard constant praise for. Um, there's always going to be somewhat of a rotation at the running back position, but I, Chris, think Marshawn Lloyd is a true bona fide feature back, um, a dude. When you look at, at Mike Bobo in the past and how he's featured running backs and fed them the football, I, I think even as a true freshman, this guy's going get, gonna to get the rock. And you know what? An added thing to this is that with, with everyone being at home and being spread out and not really being able to work out the way they, uh, they want to right now, I actually think that's kind of an equalizer because what do we know about Marshawn Lloyd? Very self-driven. He has a private personal um, trainer back at home. Um, anybody who follows him on Instagram – knows that um, he, he works out all the time and that's not just for show on Instagram. He's anybody will tell you this dude is a workout warrior. So I think even though he's a true freshman, even though his spring got limited, like everybody else's, my, my expectation is just, I mean, this kid is a professionally mind. He has a professional mindset. Um, he brings that to the college level. There's only so many guys that have the, the combination of talent from balance, speed, power, vision, um, feet, ability to catch the football, and then combine that with work ethic, um, the right mindset. Um, I mean, this kid even is very, very particular about what he puts in his body, about what he eats. So that, that to me, Chris, is a rare combination. I, I think Marshawn Lloyd is on the field for snap number one this year, and I think he's South Carolina's feature back. Who else plays? You know, we'll, we'll see. I, I think Kevin Harris, if healthy, is going to be on the field. Is he is he the number two back, or is he more of a short yardage, sometimes even up back, full back type guy? Um, does the Quandre White get in? Uh, you know, they're they're going to be waiting on his grades. People I talk to say this kid is talented enough to at least push Marshawn Lloyd and, and rotate with him. Then, you know, you, you got a guy like Deshaun Fenwick who has helped uh, helped his cause this spring through five practices, um, you know, impress Mike Bobo and, uh, you know, someone that we shouldn't forget at, at all. So I, I think from everything I've heard and everything I know you've heard as well, Chris, the running back position, even though they lost basically four seniors, if you count A.J. Turner, they're, they're in good shape at this spot. And I, I don't think there's really a huge concern um, – even Rashad Amos, the, the true freshman coming in that gets completely overlooked by everybody, a, a lot of people that I talk to are high on his ability as well. So I think running back is a room that you're just not really concerned about. And to answer the question specifically, I think Marshawn Lloyd is the guy. Yeah, I mean, you'd, you'd love if you're a Gamecock fan or the staff, I'm sure, to have another year, a redo of, of Tavian Feaster and Rico Dowdle if you could have both those guys healthy. When they were both healthy, Wes, they were good last year. And, um, you know, having them back would, would be significant, but that's not the way it goes. You don't get to just hit the reset button. And so you are going to be a little shorter on experience this year, and I think that's really your your main concern going in. But in terms of talent, you know, if you, if you do indeed have Lloyd and Zaquandre White, that's a couple of guys with legitimate talent and, and – the amount of people, I mean, literally everybody you talk to in the program, if you start talking to them, it's always that that line you use about Marshawn being a dude or some variation of that always comes up. White can give you some speed and athleticism. Kevin Harris, I think, can go give you some carries and do a really nice job as long as he's healthy. And, Wes, you know, Deshaun Fenwick had a really good spring. Um, not saying that, you know, nobody knows how, how much he's going to play, you know, because there is going to be some talent on this roster. But Deshaun is someone that, um, from what from what I've heard during the spring, was playing the best ball since he's been at South Carolina. 
you know, had been the most consistent, was doing a nice job, and Mike Bobo, you know, singled him out too. So there are some options for sure. And I think I, I feel fairly good about that position as long as they have a full boat of healthy guys on the roster, the guys that they could have there. All right, let's keep rolling through here, Chris. Um, I told you I'd come back to you, Dylan. Um, any chance Sterling, um, Aaron Sterling could play Buck this year? I wouldn't rule it out completely. I don't think that's ideally what they want to do. Um, now, I will say this. If, if other guys don't step up at that position and then Jordan Birch just isn't ready or something like that, to me, he, he may be the guy you look to, um, especially if, if you feel like Enigbare and if you feel like Joe Anderson has maybe stepped up at that other defensive end spot, um, you can always slide Keir Thomas back out that other defensive end spot if you had to in a pinch I think you could see it I, so I wouldn't rule it out you know they may end up having to just sort of play two traditional defensive end spots as opposed to um you know the the, the way they align it right now uh, Chris I, I think that would be more of let's do this as an adjustment because that's what we have to do as opposed to something that I think they want to do or plan to do. That's not something we've really heard as, as part of the plan. Would you agree with that way of, I guess, putting it? Yeah, I think it's a good point. And, and you know, the funny thing is that that question comes up. It's a good question. I've had the same question. Um, it comes up every year, you know, and um, South Carolina's typically had a guy that they can play behind DJ Wanham to pick up some snaps, whether it's, you know, Bryson Allen Williams could play some buck as well uh, when he was on the roster, uh, Danny Fennell you know, could play it. You've had Brad Johnson on the roster. So this year without Wanham, it's going to be Brad Johnson and then, you know, somebody else, whether it's Rod Fitton, he could play Sam Buck um, or get Jordan Birch in there. So you could look at moving an Enigbari or a Sterling, but Wes, those two guys in tandem were very important, you know, going one and two, basically being an interchangeable part at end. And so ideally you really want to keep both of them there and have Jordan Birch come on and be able to give you a handful of snaps each game. Yeah, definitely. Um, by the way, while we got everybody, we do have um, – we got two options going right now if you want to sign up. We got – we still have our 50% off that's live. And um, if you're not ready for that, you can actually sign up for a 60-day free trial to Gamecock Central. Um, I don't think we have a link up promoting it yet, but we'll have that up uh, by the end of the afternoon. So if you're just joining us on here and you're not a subscriber yet, please uh, feel free to try those two options out. Uh, let's see. Let's hit a few more of your questions here. Where'd it go? Um, Rob, we'll hit you next. We've talked about this one as well. Who um, who starts at center, Chris? That's um, it's an intriguing question and one that I thought it was very interesting that Will Muschamp mentioned Javon, uh, not Javon Kinlaw, uh, but uh, Javon Gwynn has uh, an option at center. Uh, it seems like the offensive tackle spots have been solidified, at least in a sense of them feeling really good about where they are without having to put Sedarius Hutcherson at, at that position. How it actually plays out, I think, remains to be seen. But they feel great about their options there uh, is what I'm trying to say. So that means Sedarius Hutcherson 100% locks down one guard spot. Um, end of story, game over. So then you have Javon Gwynn. And I guess Jordan Rhodes sort of fighting it out for the other guard spot. Uh, we know that, I mean, what would you say? Eric Douglas, Hank Manos, Vinnie Murphy. Those are probably the three that were battling it out at center. So then I think you kind of have five, five guys for two spots left. And uh, so that's those three I just mentioned at center. And then Gwen and Rhodes at guard. And then it becomes – which two give you your, your best combination? So if both and, – and I think Javon Gwynn is one of them. Like, I think he's on the field somewhere. Uh, so then if you consider that Gwynn is on the field somewhere, it becomes is – who's a better player right now? Jordan Rhodes, Manos, Douglas, or Vinny Murphy? So you have four guys basically competing for one spot. If the answer is Jordan Rhodes – then I think that means Javon Gwynn slides to center. If the answer is it's one of those centers that are already at center, then I, I think they start at center and Javon Gwynn is your starting guard. 
Yeah, and the, the thing about this, Wes, there, there's a long way to go, man, with this whole process. And um, Gwen could get in there. I think that, you know, the, the three guys that really came into the spring are also in there, those being Douglas, Manos, Vinnie Murphy. Um, those are all guys that, you know, have different attributes to them and um, that, that you could like there. And, you know, they didn't even get all the way through spring ball. Right now, you know, at some point, summer program, maybe. And then you got preseason camp. And so I think there could be a lot of shifts. And remember, heck, I mean, last year, man, Hank Manos won the, won the job. And then after game one, there was a change. And, and they could continue to shift some things around. And I think they feel good about tackle. And they've got some options inside. It's just about finding the best option. So I'll tell you not to sleep on Eric Douglas because um, he's played. He's never been the full-time, full-time starter. He's, he's practiced at center before, but honestly, Wes, I'll tell you, if, if I had to handicap it right now, that's probably the guy I'd actually pick is Douglas, but that's right now. Mm -hmm. um, I think we, as we move into summer and preseason, they continue trying some combos. Some guys could come on and sort of shift that around to where maybe it's Manos, maybe it's Murphy, maybe it, you know, they take a look and say, look, we got to get Gwen and Rhodes at the same time on the field because those are our best options. You know, Will Muschamp always talks about getting your best guys at a position on the field and then who's the next guy. Not necessarily who's the next guy on the depth chart at that spot, but who's your next best guy you can move. And that's really how they structure the O-line. But I wouldn't sleep on Douglas. You know, he's he's a he's a guy who's, who's battled and continued to battle. Um, but I, I, it's hard to say that, yeah, he's going to be the guy just because there's so long to go and it could really change and it could change after a game or two, you know, once they finally do kick this season off. Definitely. Uh, all right, let's roll through. Chris Aiken wants to know, um, do you think these coaches can get this group to six wins or seven with a bowl with this schedule? Uh, first of all, I think it depends on what does the schedule even look like? We, we know what the schedule is technically right now, but, is it going to be a, a abbreviated schedule? Is it going to be a schedule in the spring? Is it going to be the full schedule? Uh, we, we don't know yet, but uh, we'll answer it as if um, everything goes on as we all hope that it does. Uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's a tough question to answer. I, I tend to lean to yes. I, I think they've had some, some bad luck um, the last couple of years with, with injuries. I think that's something where they, they have a combination of two things, which is a little bit more depth, I think, across the board. Chris, and they have a situation where I think they've tried to address some of the, the injury issues. You can't address all issues, but when it comes to injuries, but the, you know, the new hire there with Paul Jackson, a big part of that hire was to try to address the number of injuries that they've had overall. Um, to me, South Carolina as a program should always have a path to getting six regular season wins and, and getting bowl eligible. So I, I tend to say yes. And, and I actually think even though there's been so much coaching change, I like the coaching hires. I, I think bringing in someone like Tracy Rocker, who, you, you know, you see what he's been able to do at previous stops. Um, he's going, I believe, for the all-time world record for most SEC stops um, in football history. And he's added another to the list in South Carolina. And um, but, but the dude develops guys. He knows what he's looking for. I think he'll be good for these young defensive linemen. I think Mike Bobo, the veteran, ability that he brings to adjust mid-game, you know, I think is huge for South Carolina. Um, I think Rod Wilson is a great hire as well. We'll see if Des Kitchings ends up being the hire for South Carolina. But overall, you know, you mentioned the staff. I, I think the staff is at least as good as it was last year and possibly is, is upgraded. And um, I, I think with a little more luck and less injuries, then yes, we, we could see um, you know, and improve a record this year. Yeah, to piggyback, I'll answer the actual question too, but, you know, it's pretty remarkable. And look, none of this is ultimately going to matter if South Carolina doesn't get to that mark. If, if there is a full season, that's where they need to get, I think. Um, there could be circumstances where that changes, but before all this craziness started, we would always get asked, you know, what's sort of that mark that they need to get to to be safe and to things to stabilize and you'd really just point to hey make it to a bowl game you know at this point and I know fans want to shoot higher and should but we're just talking realistic you know we, we don't think South Carolina is going to go from four wins to 12 this year so just what what needs to be that mark and so that's what you would set and I think it is possible 
um, to answer the question, but it's pretty remarkable that South Carolina was after a very poor season on the field and then after getting publicly placed on the hot seat by the administration and things of that nature to go out and close with the class they did with Marshawn Lloyd and Jordan Birch and, and that recruiting class of 2020 with everything they had to deal with and navigate. And then with the coaching changes in the offseason to be able to bring in, not reach, so to speak, on some coaches, but to bring in some guys that have proven veteran experience and, and you know, impactful experience, uh, whether it's Rod Wilson, who's a former Gamecock, who did quite well for himself with the Kansas City Chiefs, just won a Super Bowl, or Mike Bobo, who did very well at Georgia, and even at Colorado State, where the head coaching tenure didn't go well, he did quite well offensively there, which is what you're bringing him in to do. Um, you know, and, and Tracy Rocker, like you said, who's a really good uh, proven defensive line coach and some of the other moves. I think they've really given all the circumstances. I think they've they've had a good offseason from that standpoint. Now they have to carry that into this very, very important actual on field season. Definitely. All right. Let's get one more question. And then we uh, we, we got to talk about the announcement tomorrow. We haven't even gotten to that. Um, but uh, Coach Roller joining us from Dillon. Um, he says if Javon Gwynn ends up at center and winning that job uh, with Dylan Wanham being your starting right tackle, do they potentially move Jalen Nichols to, to guard because he could be too good to just be watching? I, you know, I, I think that's another variable, another wild card in this. Um, they've been very, very high on Jalen Nichols. We, talk, we talked about this. Do you remember when? I, I don't know. It's all run together. I don't know if it was podcast or Zoom cast or YouTube cast or what it was, but at some point, we talked about Jalen Nichols being someone that you just look at and you say the body type lends him to being someone who uh, could potentially play guard as well. Now he's, you know, I think he's explosive enough to, to play tackle and um, very explosive kid. I think he has like a 31 inch vertical or something, but a, a very strong base, um, a guy that I think can probably um, match up inside with defensive tackles and, um, you know, just fits that body type and skill set at that position as well. So, um, yeah, I think that's possible because then, you know, the way we sort of uh, trimmed it down, if you say Javon Gwynn is your is your best option at center, then that puts Jordan Rhodes in there at guard. But then do you slide Jalen Nichols over to guard and say, well, who, who's better at guard now, Rhodes or, or Jalen Nichols? I, I think that's a – an interesting discussion and, and one that Nichols, you know, ha, has a shot to win because both these guys, Ja'Kai Moore and Jalen Nichols, were able to get some valuable playing time last year as true freshmen. And I, I think that helps both these guys moving forward. Um, would it be more ideal to have Nichols inside and not having to deal with maybe the speed rush that you have to outside? I, I think that's a, a real possibility. Yeah, it is an intriguing option. You know, not one I can say that I've heard. Um, because like Wes mentioned earlier, I mean, Hutcherson is entrenched at left guard, and then you, you feel like you've got a couple good options in Gwen and Rhodes, but you've also got some options at tackle. You know, right tackle figures would be Dylan Wanham, left tackle, Justin Turnatine, and then you've got two guys sitting behind who were highly recruited, or one was in Ja'Kai Moore, and then one was a guy that South Carolina was just really high on during the process with Jalen Nichols. Both those guys played some last year, and both are really talented, so you got four options at tackle. So you look, well, do you move one of those inside? And then the question becomes, as, as you said, Wes, you know, can a Jalen Nichols beat out somebody at guard? I, I'm more inclined to think that they'll probably leave Nichols outside, if I had to say. Um, but certainly, if, if you get into a situation, you could put him at guard if you felt like, and maybe, and maybe Wolford will, will cross train him there. But I just think they have enough interior guys to where they can sort of keep their bench of interior guys and their bench of exterior guys. But, uh, you know, Wolford's shown that he's trained guys at a variety of positions, so maybe that's the route they go. Yeah, and they, they cross-train guys um, all over the place on the line. I mean, you even hear stories about, you know, just having guys take snaps at center at the end of practice just to make sure that yeah. you have an emergency option if just all chaos, you know, breaks loose and you end up having – three guys get injured at center or something. So, you know, I think they'll have a plan, even even if that means that uh, it's not something we necessarily see happen. I, I think you you always are sort of planning ahead for um, a number of different possibilities. So, 
All right, we, we said we were going to talk about Bryce Still, I wanted to go like an hour, but we're just going to have to go over. Um, so still announcing tomorrow, um, if you're watching this as an archive video, uh, we're recording this on Friday. So still announcing at 1 p.m. on Saturday. Uh, it is South Carolina, North Carolina, or Texas. Rivals.com will be your exclusive home for that announcement. Um, I, I don't even know how they're doing it, but it's going to be some type of live video at 1 o'clock, and we'll find out if the Gamecocks um, land uh, the linebacker who is originally from North Carolina. He's listed as being at Virginia. He's at Virginia now, but he's a uh, Raleigh area native. And I think Chris is a kid that we'll go more in depth about him as a player if South Carolina does land him. But I, I like this dude a lot, man. He, he didn't get to play his entire junior year based on um, some medical issues, but he was blowing up before that, had a really good off season, had a really good camp season. Um, you know, you, you had some major players that were after this guy, you know, your Penn State, your Ohio State's of the world. Um, but South Carolina and North Carolina really just stuck in there and stayed with him, stayed the course throughout the injury. Um, Texas came on pretty late. I mean, they offered like last month, the connection there being Coleman Hutzler, who was obviously a big part of recruiting him here at South Carolina. But uh, you know, it looks pretty good for the Gamecocks tomorrow. I, I think if it goes through, it's a uh, another nice linebacker pickup and um, another another win for for Kyle Krantz, who um, actually would would have two uh, two nice W's in a row after they got Nick Barrett. Um, I guess what that was a week and a half ago now. Yeah, I'm with you on the hard to keep track of days. Not sure if it was yesterday or a month ago or when that was, but I think that's right. Yeah, I mean, Steele would be a good pickup. We saw this kid, and we'll, we'll dive further in, as you said, Wes, uh, after after Saturday at some point. But um, he's an athletic kid. You know, when we saw him in camp, I mean, we talked about him uh, last summer and sort of going, is this kid a safety or a linebacker or both? You know, could he play either? Um, you know, when you look at him physically, he's impressive. He can really move. And so I think he's a guy that can really be um, a very solid, you know, probably a will linebacker type, just looking at him. He can play in space. He's physical. He can fill out um, and had a nice offer list. And someone that South Carolina is really, they've done a really good job as an entire staff, just recruiting him and building that relationship there and had him on campus earlier this year, again, for another trip that I think went extremely well for the Gamecocks. Yeah, and I think if if they land him tomorrow, I, I think that last trip we'll probably look back on and say that was the one that I, I think helped put South Carolina over the top. So we'll, we'll all find out. We'll see if um, if it goes their way. We'll have complete coverage, obviously. Um, and uh, man, we still there's so much to talk about, but we're gonna have to just wait until um, later on. We'll do one. I guess we'll probably do another one of these beginning of next week. I appreciate everyone joining us again and. Uh, Want to point everybody in the direction this weekend if you have nothing going on or you're looking for something to do. Uh, Patrick Davis, who we were so thankful was able to do our concert with us last week, they actually have a, uh, a really cool concert going on this week. It's all weekend long, um, starting tonight. It actually started on Thursday, but there's one tonight, Saturday, Sunday. Um, they're calling it Sip Sip, which is Songwriters in Paradise, Shelter in Place. And uh, you can find that on stageit.com. Just uh, search for Sip Sip. Every single person on there is a uh, either South Carolina native, South Carolina born, has lived in South Carolina at some point, and um, all the performers are going to be donating a portion of what they make to uh, a couple of different foundations in the state. Uh, one is is a COVID. Um, I can't remember the name of the first one. I know the second one is a uh, Mush Champs uh, Feed Our Heroes Fund again, which we were able to donate to last week. So should be a good time. That that stage it platform, Chris. It's actually really awesome. I had never used it before. I didn't had never even heard of it, but um, it's really cool how it works. Yeah, it, it really is. I, we had a blast, uh, you know, watching the concert. Patrick did a great job. And, man, he he certainly uh, gave everybody their money's worth and their tips worth who bought tickets and, and tips so generously. He played, played so long that the, they got cut off. Uh, he was still rocking and rolling there at the end. And so it was great. And we appreciate him doing that, stepping up for a really good cause and look forward to this next event that Patrick and our guy, Michael Haney, taking part in. So it's going to be a, going to be another really cool event. Yeah, definitely. So 
All right, y'all. We appreciate it. Um, I, th I think today is Friday. So yes. y'all enjoy a great weekend and um, we will continue to do these. Thank you for tuning in and go to Gamecock Central if you're not a subscriber. You can get 50% off or you can get 60 days free. Um, so if you get 60 days free, obviously there's no reason not to. So we'll have that new deal posted, I think, within the hour. Go check that out, GamecockCentral.com. Otherwise, we will see you next time on our next Gamecock Central Zoom live. Y'all have a great weekend, and uh, we'll see you then.